glad to be with you guys and um, thanks for having me. I um, am excited to talk with you guys a little bit about radiation and um, uh, and I thought in sort of putting this together that you know we would spend the the bulk of the time really just kind of given um, an introduction, particularly for the trainees, um, but uh, an introduction to kind of our field and a little bit of the uh, diversity of um, of treatments and, and some of the things that you may encounter uh, in your work. And I do have some some ortho and ortho onc specific topics at the end if we get some time, but but certainly happy to chat offline with uh, uh, with folks about their uh, their experience. So anyway, I um, have uh, been here for a little over a year now on uh, the full time faculty. I was in the community for uh, for several years before that and uh, on the adjunct uh, faculty. Uh, really happy to uh, to be here closer to uh, the trainees and um, all the great resources that we have uh, on campus. Um, so, as I mentioned before, I mean, the primary objective is really just to be a, an introduction to radiation uh, oncology, radiation medicine, talk a little bit about some of the, the technical basis for it. Uh, and hopefully uh, to have some time to talk about a few of the ortho specific. Um, uh, ortho specific topics uh, that I have here sort of at the end. I don't have any relevant uh, conflict of interest uh, to, uh, to, the, to the content of this talk. Uh, as, as you saw sort of a, on the last slide, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the overview slides at the beginning are, are kind of an amalgamation of, of uh, material that I've kind of collected over the years that, that I think sort of hit at, uh, hit at a lot of the, uh, the topics that we're going to cover. So. Anyway, uh, and then the references for the for the ortho uh, subjects at the end. Uh, so radiation. Uh, so you guys probably know this pretty well um, uh, by now in terms of the various disciplines of oncology and and, and kind of the, the training path uh, for rad onc. Uh, typically, it's a four year residency after a, a prelim year. Most folks do internal medicine, although some some will do general surgery or, or a transitional year. Um, and we we. In our training process, we'll typically see all um, all types of tumors that we treat with uh, radiation, and I would say that most everything um, has some relationship to radiation, with the exception uh, maybe of, of colon cancer, uh, which we see in a minority of cases. It, it, it's not part of sort of the standard uh, standard treatment paradigm. So, it's one of the things I really like about the field is just that you get so much variety in, in what you treat. Now, at a place like this where we have a reasonable number of rad onks, um, we're able to, to subspecialize in in, uh, in different subsites. So I treat primarily head and neck now, um, but um, uh, in the community or or even in smaller centers, it it, it does end up being uh, a bit more of a grab bag as to what you might see. Uh, so I mentioned this already. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end, actually, about a, a, a number of benign um, indications that are uh, relevant to ortho. Uh, but but there is actually a fairly and, and perhaps um, maybe an overly inclusive list sort of back in the day that you know radiation was used for acne and for for other things perhaps uh, perhaps inappropriately although it, it did work well <clears throat> nowadays there are uh, definitely still some non cancerous indications that we see patients for um, but uh, most of the uh, the more standard uh, indications are, are kind of listed here. Um, <clears throat> so what is radiation and I think that uh, this is an important question just. Um, not to um, conjure up too many memories of uh, high school physics, but um, I think it's important to sort of mention uh, kind of what the radiation is that we use because oftentimes when we hear that word, both as as doctors but also as patients, our mind kind of goes um, to uh, perhaps mental imagery that may or may not be relevant to uh, uh, you know to actually therapeutic radiation. So radiation oncology as a discipline sort of became, you know, was we still share the same licensing board as diagnostic radiology, but, you know, initially we were sort of um, under the same umbrella where, where we had diagnostic radiology and therapeutic radiology and, uh, and, and therapeutic ra radiology has changed names uh, to radiation oncology, but we still sort of share the same, um, the sort of the same Ultimate umbrella, and the reason is because we we use the same sort of uh, X-ray based um, uh, physics as diagnostic radiology, except we're just at a slightly different energy. Um, so diagnostic radiology uh, uses uh, X-rays that tend to be in the KV range. We tend to use um, uh, radiation that's in the MV range, which I'll show you. 
that doesn't have the same diagnostic resolution as uh, as sort of a diagnostic X-ray, but um, it has more of a therapeutic capability. So they penetrate more, and they have more ionizing capability, uh, and that's something that, that really is harnessed for the uh, for therapeutic potential. But again, uh, X-ray is just uh, like all of these other uh, terms which you're familiar with lie on the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, and so when we use photon-based radiation, these really are uh, you know, on that very uh, same electromagnetic spectrum you remember from high school. That's the most common type of radiation we use, although we, we do use some other sorts of radiation um, in, uh, and I'll show you these on some subsequent slides. Um, so the sorts of radiation that you think about when you think about a nuclear reactor or you think about a, a uranium or some other sort of uh, radioactive emitting source tends to be more particulate radiation as opposed to um, photon-based radiation. Um, and so there are a few examples here, which, which I'll talk about. Proton-based radiation, which I'll mention as well, is, is most closely thought of as similar to photon radiation in its sort of applications and physical properties, um, uh, despite some differences uh, in their physics, which we'll kind of touch on. So uh, I mentioned this already that, um, you know, the therapeutic x-rays are higher energy than diagnostic uh, x-rays, and they tend to penetrate much, much deeper. So they allow us to treat deep-seated tumors. Uh, and, and really, when you treat a patient with, with x-ray-based radiation, the x-rays pass entirely through them. They don't stay there. Um, the, the mechanism of action is through uh, DNA damage, which, of course, remains once the x-rays are gone, but the patients, of course, are not radioactive. But part of the reasons why often, with the exception of OHSU, um, our uh, machines tend to be in the basement is because they, they need uh, several feet of, um, uh, usually of concrete, but several feet of shielding to make sure those x-rays don't go into adjacent rooms into, into floors above and below. By contrast, some of the other types of radiation, especially the ones that we use internally or parenterally, um, are uh, ones that have a much, much shorter path length, so an alpha particle, um, has a very, very short uh, path length, and, and you probably have heard about these in the treatment of, of bone metastases. Um, beta emitters have a slightly longer uh, path length, but certainly not as long as, as gamma rays and x-rays. Um, so the, the reason why we uh, think about using uh, types of radiation that have very short path lengths as opposed to x-rays are when we try to get the radiation right up close to the tumor. So two options. Um, are giving the radiation from the outside in, so that's the, the so-called external beam radiation, the most common kind of radiation. The advantage is it's non-invasive, and we can treat, um, you know, really anywhere in the body. But um, certainly there's, there's tissue you have to pass through, and there's tissue that you exit through, uh, and that has some implication for, uh, for side effects and other things. Uh, so there is certainly an appeal to trying to give radiation right close to where you want to treat, uh, and some of that has to do with the ability to be able to access that uh, that tumor uh, mechanically. And so it might be something the GI tract, the GYN tract, the GU tract, um, which, which is amenable to um, getting radiation right in there, uh, or also interoperative uh, types of radiation, um, such as in the case of uh, retroperitoneal uh, disease and things like this. So the very first, um, and uh, Dr. Gunnelis will sort of highlight my, my true allegiance here, but our uh, sort of very first uh, use of a, uh, of a linear accelerator, uh, the, the so-called, the device that we used to generate x-rays was, uh, was at Stanford, although the, the first use of therapeutic radiation was, uh, was at Berkeley, um, at, uh, at the Lawrence Berkeley lab on the hill. Um, this here is a linear accelerator, or LINAC for short, and the idea is that this is a, a multi-ton machine that can actually spin around the patient who who's lying on a uh, on a couch that can be treated through either from the top or from the bottom. So X-rays can go through either side. The patient can be treated at 360 degrees. Um, and the advantage is that this machine is sort of a quote-unquote compact as compared with a cyclotron, which is a you know much much larger uh, device to be able to generate those X-rays and to deliver it uh, in a way that you want. Um, I don't mean to hit it at each of the elements that, that you see here, and purposely it's it's meant to not really be uh, super legible. Um, but uh, you know the, the history of radiation does go go back quite a ways um, to the 1950s, and as you'll see on the next slide, even before that, uh, dating back to uh, Madame Curie and uh, and before. Uh, but what I would say is that that over the the decades that have ensued. Um, 
there's been a, a, a I would say a, a reasonably significant advance in either the technological capability, imaging capability, uh, oncologic awareness or capability uh, that have really driven improvement in outcomes and improvement in uh, toxicity, uh, new therapeutic applications. Um, and I would say that those um, uh, those innovations do still continue despite the fact uh, the name hasn't changed. Um, and so this is something that we we often do highlight with patients because uh, I think you know for many of the things that we use, including many of the chemotherapies um, that we've been using for decades, um, uh, there sometimes is a um, there's always, there's always sort of a fine line between um, you know kind of the the tried and true and kind of uh, the standard of care versus well why are you still treating me with dot dot dot. Um, as is the case in many disciplines, but particularly this one, um, there are a number of um, members of our care team that work very closely with us and also behind the scenes um, that uh, until you sort of uh, get under the hood in radiation, you don't uh, really see. So aside from uh, from us as radiation oncologists, we have um, other full faculty medical physicists who uh, work in-house, many of whom have uh, doctorate degrees and do their own residencies and have a board certification process. And their jobs, aside from doing research, are really to make sure that, that technically um, everything uh, sort of uh, is, is operating uh, as it should and, and making sure that, that the machines are doing what, what we want them to do, uh, which, is, which is important because once you put radiation in, you can't take it out. We have other uh, folks called dosimetrists and therapists who are, are technologists who help us in treatment planning, treatment delivery, uh, and of course, uh, the other um, uh, critically important disciplines uh, of the care team that really help us in the care of our patients uh, at, at various stages of the, uh, of the process. Um, so overall, uh, the care path is very similar to uh, other disciplines, um, but one of the things that, that happens after uh, initial consult is a is a process of what we call radiation simulation or the planning session, and, and what that really is is a dry run of um, of radiation um, that's going to occur subsequently. Now, radiation is given over multiple uh, different treatment schedules, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But I, I most closely analogize it to sort of having a mortgage for those who are a loan for those of you who have student loans or or a house mortgage. That um, ultimately, when we when we deliver radiation, it's, it's ultimately the same house price or the same loan price, but it can be amortized in different ways um, to achieve uh, the same net result at the end, but the sort of the pain, uh, the fraction size or the monthly payment or however you wanna break it apart is different depending on how long you sort of spread it out. So actually sort of counterintuitively, the, more, the longer you spread out radiation, the more gentle it is in a way. Um, but there are different fractionation schedules that achieve different objectives, whether it's curative or palliative or, or, or something in between. Uh, and this is important because I think based on what you're treating, based on the patient's comorbidities, based on whether systemic therapy is being used, whether it's a retreatment, whether it's radiosurgery versus uh, adjuvant or fractionated type radiation, um, the way in which you, uh, which you think about delivering it can be very, very different. But the simulation sessions really is that starting point where we, where we try to basically get the data we need to plan their treatment. I'll talk a little bit about some of those considerations later of, of what we look for when we, when we do that session. And there's a whole process that happens behind the scenes, typically over about a week or, or in some cases as long as two or three, depending on the, uh, the technical complexity of that particular treatment. Um, where there's a treatment planning process. It's a, this is a very iterative process where we, um, you know, we work closely with the technical team to, to plan that treatment. Um, and, and this can take a, this can take a long time because what you're really trying to do is balance um, oncologic effectiveness with toxicity. You're trying to uh, balance patient specific factors and technical factors. Um, and, uh, and so this process can certainly take a, a long time behind the scenes. Uh, and then there's a whole uh, safety process that happens uh, before the patient even shows up. They get treated and then and then we see them in, in follow up. Uh, and depending on the indication, sometimes we'll be seeing them in follow up for uh, for many, many years. And this is really helpful to, to us and also the patient, obviously, aside from the oncologic reasons, can be very, very helpful at, at, at looking at uh, toxicity and being proactive about things that can manifest uh, in the future. I'm gonna skip over this. Um, I, I think uh, everyone, knows about uh, the various uh, stages of data pretty well. I think one of the things that we're really 
uh, benefited by in the, in the cancer world is is a, uh, a large amount of, of, of high quality data that we uh, that we have to rely upon. Uh, I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about uh, these curves, and I think this is sort of the the kind of um, uh, the million dollar question when it comes to the use of radiation and kind of how we adapt it to each of the scenarios that we use. Um, and so if we kind of think about, and let's just focus on this first blue line here on the left for a second, <clears throat> um, some sort of tissue response, right? So in this case, let's just call it cure, we'll call it tumor kill, whatever. Um, the response to radiation, so as you give more and more radiation over those weeks or fractions or whatever it is that you treat, you're going to get some response, but sort of counterintuitively or maybe not counterintuitively, but uh, contrary to kind of what people might think, it's not really a linear response, meaning that you don't get the same benefit sort of each day. Uh, it actually is more of a sigmoidal shape where, you know, for many patients and for many types of tumors, the, the first a period of treatment, and this can be, you know, the first half, first two thirds, even is is really an investment period almost in uh, in working towards a response. And what do I mean by that? It means that if you actually were to look at their tumor uh, uh, by imaging or, or some other means during that first period of time, um, <clears throat> you may not see much of a change. But then there there reaches a point where you start to get much much greater bang for your buck where over a short period of dose, you start to get really, really rapid, uh, rapid impact. And then at some point you start to reach uh, a saturation point where you, um, where, where additional dose doesn't necessarily give you a better response. In parallel to this, you have uh, a side effect curve, which is basically um, a curve that has a very similar shape, but what you really like to do is be in a situation where you've reached 100% on this curve while you're still very, very low on this curve. This is really a favorable site of the body, whereas some parts of the body, you still will reach um, a very good oncologic outcome, but the side effect curve may, may really sort of hug this much more closely. And this could be a part of the body. So, for example, head and neck cancer, uh, like I treat, tends to be one that's very, very responsive to radiation, just in a sensitive part of the body. And in other situations, you might be able to treat, um, you know, very, very effectively with very, very low side effects. The side effects that patients have during treatment are not uh, related to the long-term side effects um, that, that they uh, may or may not have. The other point I usually like to make, and I often tell patients about this, is that um, especially patients who are in this category is that, you know, when you're feeling the worst at the end is, is often when the radiation is um, is doing its its best. But if you take a break, so for example, sometimes we have to, sometimes there's an ice storm or whatever it is, but if you decide just to not show up for treatment, you can actually slide back on this curve. Uh, and so, you know, if you calculated your dose to sort of end you up here and you sort of slide down on the curve um, for whatever reason, you might not actually, even once you're done with your treatment, end up getting all the way uh, to the end. So it's always a balance, right? You're not just treating a tumor, you're treating a patient, of course, but um, there's always a balance between, uh, you know, tough love and encouragement uh, versus uh, you really need to be practical uh, based on a, a patient-specific sort of issue. And I think part of the art comes in in, in trying to um, assess this at the, at the outset to make sure that you're, you're doing right by the patient in the long run. Uh, so the linear accelerator on the inside um, is, is a fairly complicated machine, but suffice it to say, the way this thing works is um, when you when you plug it into the wall, you know, electricity, of course, are electrons. Um, and what happens is, um, you know, those electrons are uh, accelerated, to, you know, down this long tube um, and, you know, are, are going near the speed of light uh, at the end of that tube. They hit a metal target, and by hitting that target, uh, photons are generated. We can, through the head of the machine, shape the uh, the beam of that radiation uh, with millimeter precision based on what we're trying to treat. We can also treat with those electrons directly, and those have different physical properties. And there are different uh, terms that you may see that, that have to do with how we technically can deliver this radiation. There are um, certain situations that sort of the standard, more conventional approaches uh, work, and there are others that, that require much more um, complicated uh, approaches. The ability to shape the radiation is sort of shown here. These, these leaves are called uh, collimator leaves, and basically they move uh, in and out, sort of um, like a stencil, uh, I guess, to, um, 
sort of block radiation where you don't want it to go and to shape it in, in the uh, direction that you do in the, the uh, in the shape that you do want it to go in the direction you do want it to go. So you can change the shape, you can change the orientation, you can change the energy um, and uh, the intensity. And so ultimately you're able to really sort of paint on dose onto a patient um, in a very, very precise way. I have a few different pictures of, of devices you may have heard of. These are all radiation devices. They have slightly different uh, capabilities and properties and, and applicability, but suffice it to say, uh, even though they look a little bit different, they, they ultimately are accomplishing uh, th the same thing. So cyber knife, tomotherapy, we have this here, uh, gamma knife, uh, <clears throat> all ultimately are, um, uh, are being used for the same thing, although, um, again, the clinical applicability and some of the, the specifics about how the radiation is generated is, is a little bit different. I mentioned proton therapy. Uh, protons are, um, are are particulate radiation that tend to have um, sort of physical properties closest to um, to photons, but they um, they have some physical properties that um, really sort of um, can be quite uh, potentially beneficial. I say potentially because um, you know while there are uh, good randomized data in some disease sites, the data are still maturing as to you know, which sites of the body protons offers a benefit over photons. I raise this issue because proton radiation uh, is much more expensive than photon radiation, sometimes uh, a factor of 10 or more uh, increase in, um, in cost. There are fewer proton centers uh, in the United States. Uh, they require much, much more space. Uh, although there have been uh, more compact proton centers that have been um, uh, uh, developed that, that do have lower cost. So there's certainly a, um, a health econ uh, perspective to this, uh, both practical uh, and otherwise with respect to um, financial toxicity and, and utilization and you know, uh, things like this. Um, and so ultimately, there are some situations where protons do offer uh, a benefit, but many situations uh, no, they don't. Um, there are other types of particles uh, that you may hear about that, that are used in, um, uh, in different countries or, or in, in different parts of the US uh, that have either research applications or whose uh, particular clinical role uh, is still being uh, elucidated. Uh, brachytherapy, the so-called intraoperative uh, or intercavitary or kind of this close internal radiation uh, is the other approach to um, uh, that we that we use as a contrast to external beam. Most radiation uh, is external beam based radiation, but brachytherapy, as I mentioned, uh, the internal radiation uh, is uh, is another approach that we use in in accessible sites. And this is where we can give radiation uh, over a much much um, uh, shorter uh, uh, path length and uh, potentially a much shorter period of time. So depending on what we uh, treat what part of the body we treat. It can be very, very simple uh, types of applications. So it could be, say, for example, skin brachytherapy. We could you know, literally just kind of point something at the skin. Uh, it could be something in the prostate, for example, where we put seeds in. It could be uh, GYN applications where we put in temporary applicators and, and give radiation over a short period of time. Or it can be much more complicated where uh, we place catheters at the, at the time of surgery um, and deliver radiation. Um, after surgery, uh, also intraoperative radiation uh, is um, uh, is another approach that that we often use um, in uh, especially in the abdomen, but also in the head and neck. Uh, we, we do use this a fair bit. So, um, you know, there's some indications that you may have heard about um, that are also non-cancer related. So for example, coronary artery disease um, uh, is is one such approach, um, but. You can see some of the uh, indications here and uh, various levels of complexity based on uh, what part of the body is being treated. So uh, I have some pictures here. So these are this is an example of, of seeds in a prostate where, where seeds are are placed in the OR and they stay in permanently, uh, but they decay very very slowly. And uh, the idea is that once those seeds are done decaying, uh, the prostate has got its complete amount of, of radiation. The, the advantage there is. Is really that you kind of get this done all in one setting. Uh, the prostate stays in place, um, and uh, the radiation is very, very conformal, meaning it's very, very uh, tightly uh, associated with the uh, sort of the physical parameters uh, of the prostate. 
This used to be uh, much more commonplace than it is now, although I, I will say that it is, uh, it is still done. Uh, brachytherapy uh, can be done through uh, this example of breast brachytherapy, where it can be done through balloons and other types of, uh, of applicators. These are catheters that can be placed uh, at the time of surgery. And radiation can be sent uh, down each of these catheters. So what will happen is this gets placed at surgery. Uh, the patient uh, comes to our office afterwards, um, and then radiation typically um, uh, sort of uh, kind of small metal seeds can be kind of passed down each of these catheters, and the radiation is a function of how long those those seeds are left in place. Uh, the seeds are removed, this catheter is removed, and and the patient uh, uh, the patient heals up. Um, other applications, we do this fairly commonly here, eye plaques for, um, uh, for choroidal um, cancers, uh, where basically you have these seeds that can be temporarily affixed um, to the eye itself uh, in conjunction with um, ophthalmology. Um, those seeds deliver their radiation over a period of time, typically a week, uh, and then they're removed. And this is a, a really nice technique because um, despite the fact it is obviously invasive to put uh, these seeds in place, uh, the radiation is very, very tightly conformed to, to what you want to treat uh, and sparing other um, uh, critical structures locally in that eye and, of course, the contralateral eye. We do have uh, intraoperative radiation that I mentioned. Uh, we actually had the Mobitron until uh, until recently, which we sort of decommissioned. We, we now have um, uh, it's a, a device called the IntraBeam, which is uh, which is pretty nice that uh, you know we've been uh, we've been using. I did a couple of cases uh, over the past couple of weeks. Uh, with uh, head and neck surgery, um, and, and it tends to work pretty well. But these devices, there are a number of different devices that, that exist for being able to kind of wheel into the OR and to, to give radiation right there on the spot. One of the advantages to doing that, of course, is, you know, for us, it's really great to be able to, to see where you're pointing and making sure that we're, we're pointing in the same spot. Um, and I think that's probably the single biggest uh, advantage um, to give in this sort of uh, take, there's some oncologic uh, benefits as well, uh, but it's a really nice uh, collaborative approach to be able to uh, to deliver radiation, particularly in uh, in certain cancers of the body. I mentioned we do give uh, some types of radiation parenterally, so uh, radium two twenty three is one example you, you've probably heard of, and and there are others. Um, as you know, radium two twenty three radium is a is a calcium mimetic. So if you look on the the periodic table, a few rows down is, is radium. So the body is sort of fooled into thinking that the radium is the calcium, and of course it goes to areas of, of high bone turnover. And uh, radium-223 is an alpha emitter, so it's a very short path length, and the, and the idea is that uh, uh, that the bone mats uh, that are uh, typically blasting bone mats, although it's being studied in, in a variety of, of bone mats, but typically those, those areas of high calcium turnover tend to take up this radium-223 and, and uh, the short path length the idea is that the, the MET is treated, but, but other areas of, of healthy bone in the marrow are, are, are spared. Now, of course, there's, that's the theory. The practice is uh, roughly borne out by that. Um, and I, I will say the patients I've treated with this um, do tend to, to do pretty well as far as this, this treatment is concerned. I think one of the, the real kind of, I'd say, sort of needs and next steps in this area is, is really defining uh, the patient population to use these probably earlier in their uh, disease natural history. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned that um, the radiation simulation session is sort of our dry run, it's our planning session. This is now getting back to external beam radiation where we want to bring the patient in. And really the idea is that the simulation session should allow us to devise a means to have a consistent treatment uh, plan that we implement every single day. Um, the idea at the outset is that the radiation should be roughly the same every single day as uh, the time of uh, the simulation session. And with rare exception, um, that's the case. So meaning that your treatment dose intensity location on day two is the same as day 22, um, as long as um, the patient's anatomy and weight, tumor, and all those things are holding steady. Although there are uh, some types of radiation where we actually replan treatment for each individual um, each individual day. And those are, of course, more technically complicated, um, but, uh, uh, but certainly an exciting area. Um, so radiation simulation, patients come in, and, and uh, again, this is an opportunity for us to, to think about things from a technical perspective, from a reproducibility perspective, from a patient comfort perspective. 
We have different sorts of devices that we use to help uh, ensure uh, consistent but comfortable uh, reproducibility of uh, treatment to a particular uh, that particular part of the body. So it might be you know, using a mask um, that helps to immobilize the patient. Um, by doing this, um, as long as it's comfortable and reproducible, which you know, um, I would say for the most part, you know, having worn one of these, it, it, you know, it's it's not like sitting on your couch and watching TV, but at the same time, it's not, um, you know, it's not that uncomfortable. And part of uh, making sure that the patient is in just the right position is it really allows us to be even more um, uh, exact uh, in terms of treating what we need to treat, but also treating less volume. There's less fudge factor you kind of have to add on to make sure that you're you're, you're getting your target, and that really helps to drive uh, better toxicity outcomes. But every every part of the body has slightly different um, immobilization things that we can use to either help ensure reproducibility, to displace uh, organs that potentially we don't need to treat that we want to move out of the way. Um, and uh, uh, so these are some of the things that, that you may see or hear about. We have um, other types of custom immobilization. So these, these what we call vac bags are basically bean bags that can be conformed uh, to a patient uh, or a particular part of the patient's body. Uh, the air is removed uh, so that you have this sort of rigid uh, but patient-specific uh, immobilization. And then once they're done with treatment, the air can be let in, the thing can be cleaned and, and, and reused. So that's really nice to be able to use, usually in conjunction with one of the other ones um, that, I, that I showed you before. So the picture of some of these backlog bags. Uh, and then a few pictures of other, other types of things that, that, that you may see or hear about. Uh, belly boards, uh, an example of you know, oftentimes the small bowel is something that we're usually not treating, uh, but can usually manifest in, in much of the GI related toxicity that patients who are getting treated to the lower abdomen and pelvis experience. So one of the nice things about actually treating patients prone with a belly board is this, this can often physically displace the small bowel, uh, really uh, allowing us to achieve uh, you know, much, much better toxicity, particularly for, for pelvic structures like bladder cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, things like this. Uh, so these are examples of breast boards. So oftentimes we treat patients supine, but sometimes we'll treat patients uh, prone, and this can really be helpful for reproducibility, minimizing dose to the, the heart and to the, uh, uh, to the chest wall as well. Uh, those masks that I showed you before, uh, this material is called aquaclass, which basically is a it's kind of a, a, a nice pl plastic polymer that uh, is, is malleable when, it's at, um, when the temperature is raised, so when it's warm. And then once it cools, it hardens and becomes sort of a, a rigid um, mask, if you will. They can see and breathe through it, but it's really nice to, um, to be able to, to conform this, particularly for, for shoulders and up. Uh, it can really help to make sure that those patients are, are in just the right spot. Uh, in the head and neck wall, we'll often use bite blocks. Uh, and other sorts of uh, devices uh, inside the mouth to, to physically displace structures like the tongue or the hard palate or things like this based on what we're wanting to, uh, wanting to treat. Um, some centers uh, are even doing 3D printing of some of these uh, in conjunction with dentistry, so there's some pretty cool applications there. We don't use these as much uh, here, but at other centers I work, we, we tended to use uh, rectal balloons. So uh, rectal balloons are uh, about as unpleasant as you might, uh, as you might imagine from the name, but um, the reason why we use them is sort of shown here that, um, you know, for, for not only the physical position of patients, but the, the daily position of the internal organs can significantly change um, the reproduci reproducibility of that treatment and the toxicity of that treatment. So, you know, one, one really good example is kind of looking at the pelvis where we, um, where we look at, uh, you know, the filling of the bladder and the rectum uh, and how different that can be per day and how different the physical location of structures that we're trying to treat can be. And so sometimes this is um, sort of addressed by, um, uh, by trying to reproduce as best as possible the, the amount of liquid a patient drinks or sometimes even using a catheter. Um, for the rectum as well, um, the caliber of the rectum, particularly if we're treating something with, with very high dose adjacent to it, like the prostate, the filling of the rectum being off by even you know five millimeters can really change uh, the dose that's delivered to the anterior rectal wall, and so sometimes uh, for very high precision treatments, the use of, of uh, a rectal balloon or other sorts of polymers can sometimes be helpful at, at really sort of uh, making sure that the the rectum is as far away uh, from what we're trying to treat um, as we can as we can have it. Um, 4D CT is another um, approach that, that's often used. 
Um, and this is especially important for uh, thoracic tumors and sort of uh, diaphragm or sort of upper liver and up where the tumor itself may be moving at various stages of the respiratory cycle. And you can imagine that if you're, you're treating something um, that looks static on an image, but is actually moving around as uh, the patient is uh, respiring, you're going to potentially under treat that tumor because you're really only going to be treating it for a, uh, a fraction of the time that that tumor is actually within the region of space that you think it is. And so by taking a movie, basically taking multiple CT scans and recreating kind of how uh, this tumor moves with respiration, you're able to either potentially do what we call gating, which is basically where you just treat it when the tumor is in a particular window uh, of space. It may be you have the patient take a breath hold, so uh, the tumor doesn't move as much and you can treat a smaller area. Or you treat it in all phases of the respiratory cycle, meaning the patient is allowed to breathe as normal and you end up treating a larger area. So say, for example, this tumor looks like it's in this location on the static scan, but if it's moving, it might be as high as here and as inferior as here as the patient's going up and down. And so you might actually have to end up treating a much larger area to capture that tumor at all phases of the respiratory cycle. Again, it all depends on the patient's, um, uh, the reproducibility and, and that, that particular patient's uh, issues, obviously the size of the area and, and other things. Um, and this is where that simulation session really comes into play to make sure that that, uh, that you've got a plan that you really can that you can really do well for that particular patient. So, um, you know, from this point on is really kind of the the planning uh, process. And as I mentioned, that can take uh, quite some time depending on what part of the body you're treating. One of the things that you you for those of you who spent some time with us, and I would encourage those of you who who want to and are able to to come and check out what we do to. Uh, to do so, but um, you know, really, what we do is we sort of plan most of these treatments on CT-based imaging that we that we take in house, and what we do is a process of contouring, which is basically um, kind of identifying for the computer, you know, different structures, um, what they are, also structures that we want to treat, uh, structures that we may want to avoid. And what this allows us to do is to define really in three-dimensional space. You know what the anatomy of the patient is, what the anatomy of the treatment volume is, and to start to begin to think about um, getting radiation in, but but sparing some of the other critical structures uh, in that area. We oftentimes will use uh, ancillary imaging that we either um, order uh, in the in the process of radiation treatment planning, or or is um, or is otherwise available. This is an example of a patient with a head and neck tumor where. You know, the CT-based imaging provides you some anatomic information, but really the um, uh, really the, um, uh, the anatomic extent uh, may be much better delineated through either MR or, uh, or PET fusion. So what we can do is sort of superimpose these uh, in a computer and to be able to, to help, uh, you know, really identify on that CT scan, you know, where the disease is um, and maybe look for other things like areas of perineural spread, for example, lymph nodes that might be morphologically uh, normal, but might uh, potentially have some, uh, from some disease in them, so for example, here. Um, so uh, image treatment is really, really helpful. Um, one of the points that I that I often like to make, and I, I make this a little bit when I show the, the timeline slide, but is to say that the um, the areas that we treat with radiation, despite all of the technological advance, the areas that we we treat with radiation are are so so different than they used to be. And I just put up this this example from not too long ago. You can actually see here, I think, with this wax pencil. This was in the late '90s, um, <clears throat> where folks were, um, uh, you know. For this patient with lung cancer, treating uh, with what we call two dimensional radiation, which basically is um, not treating off CT based imaging. This is a plain film, as you can tell. And patients are basically treated APPA. So there's a field coming from the front, a field coming from the back. They get roughly 50% of the dose on, on both sides um, uh, of the body. And as you can imagine, uh, by doing that, the dose is very, very lumpy. It's very heterogeneous because, as you can imagine, when you treat a patient APPA, the thickness of the patient, the thickness of the tissue, the type of tissue that the radiation is passing through is so different based on what particular slice, the Z slice of the body that you're at. The other thing is this wax pencil sort of delineates the shape of the field. Basically, everything inside here was being treated and everything outside wasn't. 
it is a gigantic, gigantic area, very non-surgical, um, very, um, uh, very, very large. And, and the thing about it is that by doing this, you know, you were pretty certain you weren't going to miss, but there was a lot of collateral tissue that got treated here that you really didn't to, you didn't need to treat. And so nowadays, um, the, the treatment volumes are totally different. The other thing I would say is that the quality of the imaging, right, uh, you can sort of make out the extent of the, uh, uh, of the lung tumor here, but, uh, you know, sort of the true extent of, of that tumor, the true extent of the mediastinal involvement or not, um, is really hard to discern from this. And so I think the, uh, in addition to being able to treat uh, in a much more exacting manner, we also have much, much better imaging. And we have, of course, better data to know what we need to treat and what we don't need to treat. So the advent of CT-based imaging, where we can be much, much more conformal or kind of corresponding to the shape of what we need to treat has really, really helped decrease toxicity and improve outcomes by really making sure we're treating what we need to treat and treating just what we need to treat. And so sort of more advanced techniques where we're able to really shape that dose in a very, very um, exact way has really allowed us to be much, much more precise as to what we're going to treat. And, and this, this sort of uh, visual example of some of the differences for kind of more 2D-based treatment to uh, more uh, conformal treatment allows us to, to think about the use of radiation in a much, much more uh, tailor-made um, and uh, much, much more specific way where uh, you're really just being very, very um, uh, exact based on what the uh, kind of the beam's eye view of that patient is at any particular orientation. And in fact, you know, the advent of, of radiosurgical techniques, both in the brain, but also in other parts of the body. So you may have heard some of these terms, SBOT, SABRE, where, you know, many of the same physical properties of the radiation uh, are common with kind of more standard types of radiation, but we're able to deliver uh, very high ablative doses of radiation to very small targets. By treating a small area, you are able to increase the daily dose. So getting back to our mortgage uh, analogy, which I, I gave you a while ago, if you have a very small loan, you're, you're much, much more able to uh, pay it back in, in, in a, sh a shorter number of uh, payments as opposed to a much larger loan. And the analogy here it has to do more with the area that we're treating, that a much, much smaller area can be delivered to a much higher dose in a shorter period of time, as long as you're able to technically get the radiation there uh, and make sure that you're treating just what needs to be treated. So in a patient who has a bunch of lymph nodes at risk and you're trying to treat um, uh, something uh, that, that might be a larger area, you might not want to do something like this, but a patient who has uh, a single bone mat, a single brain mat, or even a, a handful of these, you can deliver radiation that um, that's in, in many cases comparable to a surgical technique in terms of local control. Now, of course, it has to be a well-selected patient, uh, and you you probably have heard about you know um, different sorts of indications where um, where radiation might uh, be able to play a role particularly in patients with metastatic disease or low volume metastatic disease. Um, there are certainly situations where from a pain perspective, a palliative perspective, uh, or other um, uh, disease modifying or, or symptom modifying uh, paradigms, uh, this approach is used. But suffice it to say, uh, radiosurgery is, uh, you know, what we've been speaking about for the, for the past 45 minutes, but really uh, a much, much smaller area uh, with a higher dose over a shorter period of time. And there are some indications, including uh, some benign indications, particularly uh, intracranially, that we that we often use these for with uh, with very good uh, good efficacy and a, and a favorable uh, toxicity profile. Uh, just for the purpose of time, I'm going to skip over this, um, and I'm going to skip over most of these slides so we can kind of move on to the to the ortho stuff. Um, one of the things that we do, um, and I'm just as I'm clicking through this, I'll just kind of um, talk about with you is that um, by planning the patient as we have, but taking imaging of the patient on the day of treatment, we're able to make fine um, modifications to their treatment plan and their treatment area um, such that we can not only ensure that the target is being treated, but we can really minimize the area that we have to treat. So this example that I sort of clicked through was sort of the kind of classic example, let's say you had a patient who had a brain tumor, you could treat a much larger area to make sure that your tumor was, was definitely being treated even if the patient was off by a little bit. But if you start to think about shrinking your volume, it becomes even more important to make sure the patient's not off just a little bit. 
uh, in a given day. And so this is where this sort of image guided approach where where you treat just the minimum area, but but the onus then becomes on us to then say, is the patient is the treatment plan exact for that particular day? Um, and so this is where various sorts of onboard imaging come into play. So this is a couple of slides um, from some of the virtual reality um, capabilities we have um, that uh, are used in patient education and, and uh, trainee education. But our machines, you, you saw that linear accelerator uh, that delivers sort of the treatment beam in orange, but I mentioned to you that diagnostic x-rays use lower energy um, that help to provide better spatial resolution. So many of these uh, machines nowadays will have onboard imaging, which is not quite as good, of course, as a, as a normal diagnostic scan, but can really help us uh, to take imaging of the patient on that particular day. So you can see what their bladder filling looks like, you can see what their rectal filling looks like, and potentially make a modification uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, so a patient, typically when they come in, will be sort of laying with their, mo their mobilization, um, and um, uh, the machine itself, a you know the treatment head it's, it will sort of spin around them. The um, you know, the panels of the onboard imaging um, will be deployed usually at the beginning, um, and uh, modifications made before the patient is treated. So um, you know we have some pictures here that that we often like to show patients just to kind of to show them what's being treated, uh, kind of how that relates to to where they are on that treatment table. Um, okay. All right. Um, so before we kind of move on for the last few minutes of um, of the talk, I just one of the points I, I often like to make is is that the side effects that patients um, get during radiation are very specific to several different factors. One, and probably the most importantly, is the side of the body that's treated. Um, that side effects can be very very different based on uh, whether you're treating a breast versus the head and neck versus versus the bone. Uh, which is sort of highlighted on those curves I showed you earlier. The other has to do with the dose that's used, um, and so for uh, and also the area that's treated. So for larger areas, higher dose, um, there can certainly be a very very different toxicity profile than uh, than a shorter, uh, more compact uh, type of treatment. I mentioned to you that there are short term toxicities that happen during treatment, and there are longer term toxicities, which uh, some examples uh, are listed here that uh, are very, uh, they typically are rare, um, and they, they generally don't have a relationship to the acute toxicity, meaning that a patient who has you know, really brisk acute toxicities may or may not have brisk late toxicities and vice versa. Uh, but late toxicities tend to be more permanent, whereas acute toxicities tend to be more temporary. Um, <clears throat> so for each uh, part of the body, for each uh, uh, type of patient, their clinical scenario, uh, their other medications and systemic therapies and comorbidities uh, might drive um, whether one of these may be more pronounced than, than another, but these are things that we, we often will be managing medically during treatment and, and of course, afterwards. Uh, and some examples are here, and I think, you know, some of the things that we often sort of run into, I think, which is the case for all of our specialties, is we often, um, you know, we often in the hospital will see some of the outliers of patients who who are um, you know on one end of the spectrum or another, or see a patient at one stage of the the uh, um, the sort of treatment continuum with a temporary side effect, and so I think the the antidote to that really is to you know come and spend time and to to kind of learn about, especially in areas that have some overlap to to your uh, your discipline. Um, to you know, try to get a sense for you know kind of what is the 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 average experience for an average patient, um, and so uh, these are some examples of, of um, uh, short and in some cases long so these are telangiectasias that can occur particularly in patients who have been treated to the skin, um, alopecia for example, and sort of some of the time course of of resolution and, and perhaps what that resolution may look like. Um, so just in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to to show a couple of uh, of potential ortho related uh, topics um, that that uh, many of you know about um, and uh, uh, many of the trainees have, have had some experience with. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, you know, this isn't an inclusive list and certainly for uh, various sorts of uh, soft tissue sarcoma uh, and other sorts of sarcomatous disease, chordoma, other uh, other types of tumors that that are um, um, 
certainly within the uh, ortho onc uh, realm. Uh, I'm not going to uh, really be able to spend too much time talking about today, um, but uh, some really uh, interesting uh, approaches with uh, protons and other sorts of um, uh, types of treatments uh, for these conditions. Um, the more common things that we tend to see, um, you know, of course, are the bone and spine mets, um, and then other types of uh, benign type uh, conditions like HO, for example, uh, depending on uh, the center. Um, uh, the volumes of, of patients that, that we treat uh, with uh, prophylactic radiation uh, can be can be pretty uh, variable, but it's a it's a pretty nice and, and satisfying approach. Um, and we do tend to see a fair bit of benign disease, so like Dupuytren's and Lederhose disease, uh, warty conditions, and uh, and other types of things uh, that might have some overlap. Um, so this is more an education slide for the rat onc residents. I know that that for the um, for the ortho trainees, this is. Um, this is pretty well known to you, um, but it, you know certainly we always appreciate the ability to kind of uh, think together about patients, particularly with uh, with bone mets um, and, and also spine mets, which I have on the next slide of, of really how to manage these patients uh, in terms of uh, the need for surgery, uh, in terms of the need for some other sort of uh, interventional capability. Um, and, and also with the increasing use of, of SBRT and other sorts of ablative uh, techniques, um, how to best think about the use of um, sort of multimodality therapy uh, in the management of these patients. Many of these patients um, are, are not what they used to be, meaning that many of these patients are going to live for a long time. Uh, patients are younger, uh, and so really needing to think about how best to approach this with their um, with the rest of their life in mind. Um, there have been, and I sort of glossed over this before moving on to the slide. There, you know, there have been, um, you know, increasing reports on the on the um, on how best to fractionate uh, these sorts of patients um, in, in terms of the, the duration of treatment, particularly in the palliative context, um, the, the use of surgery, but increasingly the need for uh, retreatment, especially of patients with spinal disease, oligometastatic disease. We're really lucky to now have. Um, a dedicated palliative radiation oncologist in house, uh, Dr. Eric Chang. Many of you who uh, you may know or who have worked with or will work with, uh, who's a very thoughtful, um, especially in this space. And and this is uh, this is a good problem to have, but this is an increasing problem to have, where patients are um, are are needing to be uh, treated with uh, with radiation uh, multiple times to the same area. When you treat patients with palliative radiation, what you're really doing is you're treating them with not really a tumorcidal dose, but you're you're trying to sort of shift the balance of power, of course, towards bone healing uh, as opposed to um, uh, cancer destruction. But the idea by by doing this is you're trying to keep side effects as low as possible. But the challenge is when you give radiation to a very low dose, you're really not killing all the tumors such that you're you're, you're leaving a fair bit of tumor behind it in time, sometimes six months, sometimes you know uh, shorter or longer. That tumor is going to regrow, and, and you're sort of faced with the problem of needing to do the same thing again. And so, increasingly, uh, as patients live longer, we're we're thinking about you know how, how do we do that, right? Do you, do you think about giving a much higher ablative dose up front, or or at, at an earlier stage, so you don't have to retreat those patients? Is that um, does that make sense from a patient perspective and an economic perspective, and 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 certainly how we think about things with with colleagues like you are, are really important at. Um, and trying to understand well, what do we sort of see as their kind of uh, their future as far as their their functional capability, their disease capability, or their disease status, uh, and so forth. For the spine, I think there, there's been um, sort of uh, you know sort of parallel thoughtfulness, I guess, with respect to um, the stability of the spine, but also how best to kind of incorporate. Um, uh, neurologic function of the patient, uh, the oncologic um, uh, aspects uh, of treatment. So, for example, uh, you, you could envision that um, a tumor that's that's radiosensitive, meaning effectively killed by radiation, versus one that's more resistant, um, uh, lesions that are more blastic versus lytic, for example, uh, location, um, sort of mechanical considerations, other sorts of uh, disease factors, all play into. Well, how do we think about the use of surgery? How do we think about the use of radiation? What kind of radiation? Uh, how do we think about uh, multimodality therapy? So, for the trainees, I think you know many of you are, are more familiar than than I am with um, the spinal instability uh, neoplastic score, which of course is a scoring system 
um, in the spine. Um, some of the rules regarding what's sort of canonically radio sensitive versus radio resistant, I think, are are, are changing um, uh, based on sort of increasing uh, data. So, for example, melanoma is a good example of a of a histology that we often used to think was was very radio resistant, and in some situations, I think uh, data have shown that it can be quite radio sensitive. Um, it just sort of uh, depends on the context. Renal cell, uh, I think, continues to be one that that tends to be uh, pretty radio resistant. Um, things like breast cancer and lung cancer often fall in the middle, and things like small cell lung cancer lymphomas tend to fall on the, the highly sensitive side. Um, and so this certainly factors in the location, uh, the ability to tolerate surgery, systemic therapy options, all sort of factor into kind of thinking about, well, do we do radiation alone? Do we do some sort of ablative therapy? Do we do um, uh, surgery alone? Do we do some sort of uh, combination approach? Uh, HO is... Uh, Put up, uh, you know, a really great uh, review on the use of uh, radiation um, uh, in HO. Um, it is is a really um, is a really sort of cool area to treat. There there are a number of them, and Dupuytren's is is another um, example. Uh, but a number of benign conditions where there's sort of overactivity of um, uh, fibroblasts or other sorts of cells in the uh, in the soft tissue, either in the healing process. Uh, or uh, in, in patients otherwise, where radiation can be delivered uh, to help sort of interrupt their uh, their function. And so, of course, in patients with, with HO who have demonstrated HO, um, you know, giving uh, you know, prophylactic, usually single fraction radiation treatment um, within either one day prior or usually three days post surgery. Um, oftentimes, the hip, but can certainly be other joints. Um, is something that, that can be done with, with pretty good effectiveness and, and pretty, uh, pretty tolerable uh, toxicity. Um, and so uh, this is something that I saw a, a lot more recently. I don't have as, as good of a sense these days for, for how much we see this here, uh, but, but certainly something to be aware of. Um, and, and of course, as I sort of mentioned at the beginning, there are a whole host of benign uh, conditions that, uh, uh, that we treat, uh, many of which are Sort of relegated to textbooks. Uh, one of the, the better examples is, is shown here, and this is this is now pretty old, but it's sort of the best uh, example for us uh, of uh, of different fractionation approaches. Many of which were developed uh, devised in Europe or kind of in, in sort of earlier generations of radiation oncology. But um, one of the things that I, I personally see a ton of is is Dupuytren's disease. Um, there seems to be some sort of Facebook group or something I landed on, so I tend to see a lot of these patients. Um, who, who find their way over, and, and you know this is a really cool, um, satisfying area to treat. But it's also one that uh, for folks uh, you know who go into hand surgery or or um, uh, you know or other re related disciplines, uh, where kind of thinking through. And there's definitely a need uh, based on you know there are uh, there are as you know quite a number of patients out there who. Um, who suffer from this uh, and other related conditions, where there just really aren't good data on the use of, you know, how do we think about um, uh, surgery versus uh, injection, local therapy, radiation? Uh, how do we, uh, you know, incorporate um, these these various treatments together? There are some randomized data on kind of single modality therapy that we often use, and patients tend to do pretty well uh, with sort of lower kind of palliative doses um, uh, of radiation, but certainly a, an unmet need. So um, anyway, I, I'm going to wrap it up there. I, I, I'm happy to stay on the line and, and uh, also correspond with folks um, uh, offline if, if folks have questions. But uh, again, I appreciate your uh, having me today. Thanks for, uh, uh, for sticking around. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks so much for uh, joining us and uh, teaching about us about all of the stuff that we intersect with, as you mentioned, in uh, in, in multiple ways. You know, I, I'm curious about the the Dupuytrens. You know, we have a lot of patients who will uh, sometimes not want to get three views uh, of an extremity because of radiation exposure, and we kind of have to explain that to them. I'm 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 surprised. What what do you you know do you, what what do people say to you or or when they're talking about something that's particularly benign disease uh, about the you know potential risks of radiation and things like that or or do those patients just not come to you good question yeah there's certainly a, a sort of a enrichment 
uh, for patients who I think are are either positively inclined or um, uh, at least kind of on the fence uh, about it. I think the um, you know generally speaking, you know, radiation and and chemotherapy both do carry a risk of uh, of a secondary malignancy as a function of treatment through sort of the mutagenic potential of or the mutagenic the mutagenic potential. Uh, of um, of these treatments, radiation it tends to be in the area that's treated, um, and so you know it's and and oftentimes can be treated with subsequent radiation, but certainly a a factor in patients who have benign disease. Um, I would say the things that that often prompt patients, uh, particularly with Dupuytren, to come and who are wanting radiation would be a you know, prior failure of some other surgery, some other local therapy. Um, B patients who, uh, for whatever reason, just uh, just don't are just not inclined towards some sort of surgical approach. Um, and C maybe that I think there are definitely some patients who come in who um, are kind of potentially early in the disease course who feel like it's going to be some sort of a they're not quite at the surgery. They're not quite bad enough, I guess, to, um, uh, to to need surgery or something else, and, and want to kind of sort of nip it in the bud for uh, for lack of a better term. And and it's hard to know because you know for many of the patients, I think the counseling that I give usually is that we say, you know, the the, the, the goal of treatment is to stabilize disease, but but really, you know, it's hard to kind of wind back the uh, the clock on on. Uh, you know, lesions and nodules that have already been um, um, already been deposited. Some patients, I think, after treatment do get some symptomatic benefit, but um, uh, but certainly, I would say that the goal is to try to prevent progression. And so, anyway, I, I think that to answer your question, kind of a long-winded way, that most of the time, I think it's it's the patient who either has failed something or really just wants to avoid surgery. Hmm. Thank I mean, you. I would say this from a hand surgery standpoint, seeing these patients in clinic that Ruby really uh, hit it there when he said there's this group of patients where there's not any intervention to offer them because their uh, disease course is too early, specifically patients with no actual contracture, but they have cords, they have nodules, and uh, oftentimes they want to be proactive about it or just really see the options, or they may have a real strong familial history and in the hopes of preventing worsening, want to do something where I don't really have anything to offer initially, but uh, sometimes uh, Robbie and his team are able to give them something to uh, help manage these symptoms a little bit better. Great. All right. Well, thanks again so much for coming and uh, chatting with us and educating us about radiation. Really appreciate it. And I uh, hope everybody has a great Monday. My pleasure. Take cool. care.